welcome to our weekly discussion, Moral Side of the News, where we discuss the local, national, and world news of the day from a moral, ethical, and religious point of view. I'm Sean Kalen with the WHAS Crusade for Children. I'm joined today by a distinguished panel of local religious leaders, Reverend Clay Calloway, West Louisville Ministers Coalition, Father Tuan Do, Epiphany Catholic Church, Reverend Sally McLean, Christian Church Disciples of Christ, Reverend Dr. Kylan Gray, Creative Spirits Behavioral Health, and Rabbi Stan Miles, Louisville Mountain School. We begin this week with the dramatic turn of events in the Jeremy, Jamie No case after he changed his plea to guilty, followed by the judge saying he wants to hear from the victims before deciding on the plea deal. The thing that makes me the maddest is we ask for equipment life-saving equipment. It's New Chapel EMS employees like these who will have a major say in what happens next in this case. We asked for medications that when you have a haul from New Wash to Clark Memorial Hospital, those medications are life and death medications that we were requesting and being told there's no, the funding's not there, the money's not there. Well, the money was on your belt buckle. You know, that's $800 that could have gone to a life pack. Now, Judge Larry Medlock wants to hear from them. EMS workers that have lost their jobs, paramedics that are, at, are not out there saving people because the money is diverted. Pleasures. I want to hear from people that don't have $800 belts. I want to hear from taxpayers that have been aggrieved by the actions of this Former Southern Indiana Sheriff Jamie Knoll pleaded guilty to 27 of 31 felony counts in court Monday. The plea deal would give Knoll 15 years. We asked the employees what they thought of the sentence. I don't think it's enough. Lieutenant Jordan Boulard has worked at New Chapel EMS since September 2021. Her last day will be August 31st after the department announced a significant downsize. I'm a mom of three children, so I need that full-time income to support my, my boys. So. And it, it affects me on a personal level, but then it also affects me on a professional level as well because wherever I go, New Chapel EMS is going to be on my resume. Lieutenant Crystal Blevins has worked at New Chapel for two years. It's hard to think that he's doing it for any other reasons other than being selfish. Both Blevins and Boulard are urging other victims of Knoll to come forward and share their story. That the judge understands the gravity of what Jamie did and the far-reaching consequences to every citizen that's been affected. I hope that people don't fear Jamie Knoll. I hope that people, you know, want to stand up for the people of Clark County. And So we turn now to our panel. We just heard from two of the victims that the sentence up to 15 years was not enough with the restitution of paying back $3 million, is 15 years enough? And what do you think about how the judge is handling the plea deal? I think the judge is, I think the judge is doing the right thing and by giving those people who, lo who lost their livelihood and the people of, of Clark County, of, of New Chapel, who are now in severe jeopardy because of what this guy did, uh, why, but what vexes me is, why has it taken so long to figure this out, to bring this to the light of day? I mean, the guy lived in an absolute palace. He, he had all of these classic cars, I mean, and, and his salary was public record, I would presume. And I, it breaks my heart what's happening to those, those true public servants and the people served by the Newcastle uh, EMS. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad to me. It's sad to think about the impact, the long-ranging impact of uh, the citizens from the embezzlement that took place. It's a, to me, it's, it's another example of the breakdown in community and the breakdown on how the benefits that we are blessed with, with community, with 
having empathy for others and making sure that you do things that doesn't harm others. You know, when you take oaths of public service, one of your principal ethical uh, promises is to do no harm. Um, and with that is the welcome for accountability. And, and we're seeing in our society a lack of a desire to be accountable, to be held accountable for actions that are done in public service and private service and in other uh, ways. This is very horrendous and sad, as the uh, employees have shared in this clip about the impacts that the, it has had on them personally. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a reminder that we are, we are connected. We are connected with one another. And the things that we do impacts not just ourselves, but have long-ranging ripple effects on uh, other people. So it's, it's very heart-rending. And I do agree with the judge bringing the persons who have been harmed to speak their voice, to say, uh, to give record not only to uh, Mr. Noble, but to everyone that would listen to this case that, you know, to remind every, every one of us that what we do is not just ours alone. What we do in our private spaces comes out in behaviors uh, later on in our day. And so uh, we, we, we need to reclaim, uh, I don't know how we do it, but we have to find a way to reclaim a sense of connection as human beings in community to have respect for one another and to know that the things that we do impacts everybody else. Colin, that was so good, it's hard to come up with anything else to say. But um, I was thinking, first of all, don't be afraid to come in. They're saying to the other people yeah. who were possibly victims, um, and that raises a flag, is, is this just one family? Is this a group of people that are a part of this? Is this some sort of conspiracy kind of thing that's going on that they're protecting him? Um, the other thing is, this morning I was watching or reading about, in uh, Upper State New York, um, EMS is very rare there, I mean, because it's a rural community. And they have volunteers. Mm -hmm. They're all volunteers. Yeah. And so you're thinking, look at the contrast between, you know, this set of circumstances and that set of circumstances. And then I also wonder if there's any way to document if lives could have been lost because mm -hmm. of, of not having the proper equipment or the mm -hmm. proper medication or whatever the issue is. So I, I think that there are several things, and I do hope that they um, come. I, I agree. I don't think 15 years is enough mm -hmm. for what, what they're talking about. But I, I just think it's... It seems to me, I thought the only thing I had to say was, what a despicable human being, but... Yeah, to quote uh, da Daffy Duck, one of my favorite words from him is despicable, <laughs> with droplets of spittle coming out. <laughs> I think that yeah. appropriately applies this case. Yeah. Uh, if I'm out of me to cut you off there, but... No, no, I'm, I'm finished. Uh, but it, it uh, he is an elected official, is that correct? Correct. Okay. He was a sheriff. He was a sheriff, so he was elected, and uh, obviously they needed a new sheriff in town. But he, it, it was not just the victims that individually. It was any time you're an elected official, it, you're committing a crime against the community as That's a whole. That's exactly right. Yeah. When charges are brought against you, like Colin Harris reminded, she brings the charges on behalf of the people. So the whole community are victims in this particular case. And then uh, it is said where uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There should always be checks and balances in place to check power and things of that nature. I mean, an honest man, they say, never ask you to really trust him. So if there's checks and balances in place, it even keeps an honest man <laughs> to maintain his honesty because you have checks and balances there to, to give safeguards to, to protect against uh, abuses like this. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's another occasion where the, uh, corruption occurs, where there's no checks and balances of power. Uh, no accountability. Uh, one thing that, that officials, I don't care who they are, should always be held to account for what they do and don't do. And this is yet a local episode of that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's on a very small scale, but it happens all the time and, and much larger mm -hmm. scales all the time. And he's a victim of the, or he's practicing probably the, the original sin of America. And I'm doing a study on Frederick Douglass and I'm talking about slavery being the original mm -hmm. sin, but slavery is not the original sin of America, it's greed. Mm -hmm. Greed, mm -hmm. yes. Greed is the original sin of America. And this mm -hmm. is just yet the, the, the local example of that sin of greed that has permeated this country. Yeah. Um, I, I wish to echo uh, Rabbi Stan's uh, um, comment earlier. How in the world that uh, a, a crime like this uh, 
um, was let gone for so long. And I wanted to acknowledge and thank all of those um, um, uh, um, people who came out and brought uh, uh, this whole scandal to uh, public uh, hearing. And also the third point I wanted to share is that, uh, of course, there's still, we, I think the court's still waiting to hear from the wife, his wife and his daughter's um, alleged crimes uh, to see whether they concede to the uh, uh, deal or not. But still, it seemed like you said it's a conspiracy. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm astonished to just to think how they think they could go uh, like this without eventually being caught. It just echoes all of what we are saying, greed and the worship of uh, wealth, money. And uh, in our Christian and theological perspective, or from that perspective, um, from a scriptural perspective, uh, it is the worship of money that drives people mad. I, uh, one, one thing you said, Sally, about uh, liability. I'm wondering if the dots could be connected that someone indeed lost their life because the medications were not forthcoming, medications that would be standard equipment on an, uh, uh, an emergency ambulance would Mr. Noel all of a sudden become an accessory to murder, which makes a plea deal in this situation for him, for anyone else concerned, to be rather an obscene miscarriage of justice. And could then he be held accountable, is what you're saying? Could yes. He, uh, for those. Uh, yeah, and one of the things I wanted to say too is somehow in our culture we have lost that aspect of servanthood. It, mm. it has disappeared mm -hmm. and it's become um, prioritized um, with um, power and, and as we say greed and wealth but, but that concept of servanthood is, is mm. who we are and what we're about and, and, and people aren't willing to do that anymore. You know, as you think about servanthood, you know, in our, in our culture now, we have a new word, it's called self-serve. <laughs> mm. And it's common. <laughs> yeah. You go to the grocery store, you go to Walmart, it's self-serve. So self-serve has become the new, a, a new reality of the day. Serve yourself. Mm. And serve yourself first is, is, is the new order of the day, sad to say. So. Clay, you made a uh, mention about it being ubiquitous, that this mm -hmm. is, this is, we see this happening a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we see it happening a lot in our religious spaces as well. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of pushback from a lot of leaders that, of religious spaces when, when persons want to hold leaders accountable, particularly around fiscal practices, that, that mm -hmm. there's, that, uh, there's a, a continual development of uh, having worked with a lot of congregations within a particular region and most of the conflict that I'm working with has to be centered around the, what the practice of money and what you do with money and how mm -hmm. money is being spoken mm -hmm. about and the ethics of money and the spirituality mm -hmm. of money. Um, but what starts uh, a lot of major conflict in a lot of religious spaces is the management of money and the most forces within congregations to keep mismanagement from taking place and that being interpreted as not supporting the leader or not supporting uh, the vision or being, a, especially when those spaces where they, their religious spaces tend to move toward autocracy instead of democracy, that, ha that, that, that tends to, to be the, the case. Mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, past attor uh, attorney generals of the state talked about, uh, when I was in a particular meeting and he was talking about uh, embezzlement and the thing, the safeguards for embezzlement, uh, that one of the persons that you, that the person, is usually the person that you least likely would expect. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about how long, how, how, how could things happen so long before things mm -hmm. are noticed or before the loss is big and then that's what makes the, no, the accumulation of taking money 
inappropriately. It doesn't happen. It's not taken in big sums. It's not taken in large huts, hits. It happens with, you know, little small, um, it begins with small uh, withdrawals or small places. And what the uh, former attorney general, I can't remember his name, but he said that it's you, the persons that usually get prosecuted are the people you least expect of the persons that have engendered a great amount of trust around the fiscal spaces. And then before you know it, 10 years have gone by, 20 years have gone by, and there's a, then the discovery is. Well, you know, you mentioned about it's, it's no, I don't think it's lost on the fact that when Jesus displayed one of his greatest displays of anger is when he turned over the tables of the money changers in the temple. That drew his greatest outrage <laughs> when they turned, as according to him, they turned it into a den of thieves. So he was, he was addressing the, the, the injustice of money changing in the temple in the name of religion. I was thinking when you opened the broadcast, uh, John, you said we're going to look at news from a moral, ethical, and religious point of view. They could be three completely different things. Mm. Moral, ethical, and religious. So I'm glad you made that distinction because oftentimes it could be very different when you're talking about religion. Religion doesn't automatically mean it's going to be ethical or moral. So. Shouldn't religion automatically reflect ethics and morals? No, if you worship money, that's your morals. So you're mm -hmm. a money worshiper, that's your religion. So religion does not automatically mean it's going to be oriented the way it needs it to be. I was, to be but I was thinking more of the norm, normative yeah. religious oh, faiths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think it should. Uh, our ideals are shaped that way. Our, our theology promotes the combination of the three, and, and that 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 supports the way things ought to be, and yet we find time and time again mm -hmm. when we lose sense of our ethics, mm -hmm. and we usually lose sense of that when we become much more self-centered mm -hmm. to the expense of, as mm -hmm. this case shows, mm -hmm. someone that thought of themselves mm -hmm. as a higher value mm -hmm. of pursuit of life than the good of a, the mm -hmm. commonwealth, the, common the common wheel, mm -hmm. the, the good right. of the community. Yeah, you know, it, it's, I, I agree with you that our religion does promote a harmony of ethics and values and um, and, and our spiritual sense until we become, which is the which is the really understanding of what sin is all about. You know, if, you, if there's, it's it's the placement of the self above the everybody eye in the else. middle. It's the eye in the middle. Right. And so um, mm -hmm. this is what we see, and it's a reminder all of us that we need to really check ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. and make sure that right. you know we're placing appropriate boundaries around our own s ways that we think and uh, the way we behave with and within community to make sure that we're not doing any harm. Thank you. What a great discussion. Mm -hmm. I've been doing the show since February now. It's the best discussion I've heard <laughs> from what the center of the show was supposed to be about from yeah. moral, ethical, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. religious mm -hmm. point of view. So mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, we turn now to the story making national headlines this week. Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg says he was pressured by the White House to censor content related to COVID-19 during the pandemic. He goes on to say he regrets demoting content related to the corruption allegations against Hunter Biden ahead of the 2020 election after an inaccurate warning from the FBI. For years, critics have taken aim at Facebook for silencing views that challenge the general consensus in the medical community, especially about the origin of COVID-19. Now Facebook's founder surprisingly says, they're right. This morning, Meta Chief Mark Zuckerberg admitting he bowed to pressure from the Biden administration to censor content. The Facebook founder issuing a letter to the House Judiciary Committee that said senior administration officials pushed the social media platform to censor posts about COVID-19 and expressed a lot of frustration when the company resisted. Zuckerberg saying, I believe the government pressure was wrong, and I regret that we were not more outspoken about it, adding, I feel strongly that we should not compromise our content standards due to pressure from any administration in either direction, and we're ready to push back if something like this happens again. President Biden was asked about misinformation online in the summer of 2021. On COVID misinformation, what's your message to platforms like Facebook? They're killing people. 
I mean, it really, they all, look, the only pandemic we have is among the unvaccinated. And, that, and, they're, and they're killing people. Biden later walked back the comment, insisting he wasn't attacking Facebook. Overnight, the White House responded to Zuckerberg's letter. Our position has been clear and consistent. We believe tech companies and other private actors should take into account the effects their actions have on the American people while making independent choices about the information they present. Zuckerberg going on to express regret for demoting content related to corruption allegations against Hunter Biden ahead of the 2020 election, alleging the FBI warned information circulating online was a Russian disinformation operation. It's since been made clear that the reporting was not Russian disinformation, and in retrospect, we shouldn't have demoted the story. Zuckerberg went on to say the company has changed its policies and processes to make sure it doesn't happen again. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan celebrating the letter, calling it a big win for free speech. So, panel, your thoughts on the Zuckerberg letter, which first appeared in The Wall Street Journal, and the tension between the government and big tech over how content on social media should be policed. I have a um, comment that's been in my mind about this. Is my fear is that these big, giant companies become monopoly. And uh, once, uh, just like Google recently being uh, sued and 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 uh, demanded to pay back, it, it's uh, become that they dominate everything and no one else has any other voice. And um, that's that's my greatest fears in our public arena. And uh, um, I don't think it's good for society. Although I do take into account of there is uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation we have to censor, but I, I hope the government uh, on both sides of the parties uh, come together and do in such way that help uh, those who have less a voice uh, to have a voice. Well, big companies, they have one uh, objective and one objective only is to make money. And the second objective is to make more money. And the third is no different than the first two and that's to make as much as they can. So uh, Zuckerberg is not in business to do a great common good. He's in business to make money. Mm. That's number one. So we know that as the Bible suggests, the love of money is the root of all evil. So I mean, so him being a, a, a moral compass is, is highly questionable. <clears throat> now the role of the government is to regulate whatever for the common good of, of, the, of the country. So if there was some pushback, it was for the common good of the country uh, so the motivation of the government should and is likely different than the motivation of, of uh, big, big business with Zuckerberg and Facebook. So uh, uh, I just noticed in the big picture that, that his motivation is not always in the best interest of the, of the uh, people of America. That's not his number one objective. His is to make money. And that's to be taken into account. Well, can we tie this into the last discussion about doing no harm? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I, I can remember the polio vaccine and how my mother was so excited mm -hmm. that we would line up and get whatever dose we could get. And we didn't know enough about COVID. It was not disclosed early on how dangerous this virus was. And, and I was more than anxious for a vaccine to come out with the hope that it can be eradicated. And then now we're seeing people who are uh, not getting immunizations for their children so that the measles are breaking, measles are breaking out again and other childhood illnesses. So acting, I, I, yeah, misinformation is a huge problem that we have right now. But I, I do think, again, this is, this is a moral issue. Mm. It's also, a, for me, it's an issue of national security. We know that there are bad actors out around the world mm -hmm. that are using our information ethos to do damage to our culture and to do damage to our people. And I think that it's, it's, it's the government's, not business's responsibility, it's the government's responsibility. They take, they raise their right hand and they swear to serve and protect yep. and agree. defend yeah, Americans agree. against uh, uh, enemies foreign, foreign and, and domestic. domestic. Exactly, and part of I that, agree. Part of that has to do with the information that is being <laughs> Uh, sent into this. We know that Russia and Iran and China are doing these kinds of things and other actors around the world. So I disagree with Zuckerberg saying that, that you know, we should not take down anything and not cooperate with the government 
when the safety of our people are at risk. And, and COVID mm -hmm. was one of those examples. We got mm -hmm. a host of other examples that shows. And uh, misinformation that. can take lives. I mean, sure the Bible can. says yeah. my people are sure destroyed can. for lack of knowledge. Sure can. And even Jesus on Calvary's cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what you do. So not having the right information and ignorance can be very deadly. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I agree with you, Colin, on the fact that it becomes the government's responsibility to step in if there's a threat to the public good and safety to, 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 to regulate the kind of information that's being disseminated that could affect human life. I, Clay, I agree with you, I, but I, I, I'm at a loss here because to tell you the truth, I have nothing to do with Facebook whatsoever. <laughs> I just, it's not part of my world. Therefore, it's not part of my world view. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, from what I hear, it, it vexes me and distresses me. But I just, I can see what happens and I just, personally, I don't want anything to do with it. Well, I would just mm -hmm. say that any partnership with, with Jim Jordan if he says something's good, <laughs> any, any partnership on that level right. is suspect to me. Right. I'm just, that, that's a good I just, little, just put that that's out That's a good little In other words, if he's happy, oh we should be. That's a good oh little goodness. check. Little that's indicator right I, I check into that a little bit more. Right. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to, uh, real fast, we have about two minutes left. I'm not sure we have enough time to really get into this the way we need to. But for the first time in the past several weeks, Ukraine has moved into Russia and have taken Russian land. They've gone on the offense after being on the defense for really 10 years because the war, the original war started in 2014. What do we make of that? And we have maybe, you know, 90 I, I seconds love left. It. I love it. Like David. David, when David was confronted Goliath, he was running towards Goliath. Mm. And I always like to see the little guy take it to the big guy. So mm. in that sense, I think it could be, a, it, it could be a, applauded. I'm one of those who thinks that if we can help a small country and a uh, democratic country um, to fight against uh, tyranny, um, and I do consider Putin and Russia as a country of tyranny, mm -hmm. and I somehow mm -hmm. I think the Ukrainian people have suffered enough. The world uh, need to come together to support the people and bring it to an end. It's two and a half years already. Amen. Amen. I think uh, we've been talking too much. Not much has been done. Yes. Ukraine is playing check. Check. It's playing chess. Russia's playing checkers. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to, you have to take it to the account that, that, yeah. uh, that the, the former president, move. former president, said Russia. He said this can do whatever they want to do. He gave a green light to Russia to do whatever they want to do. Oh, you're talking about right. yeah. Trump. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for a great discussion today, panel. Father Twando, Reverend mm -hmm. Sally McLean, Reverend Kemp Clay Calloway, Reverend Dr. Kylan Gray, and Rabbi Stan Miles. Thanks for watching and listening to Moral Side of the News. We'll have an all-new episode next week. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you.